Welcome, happy to, it's Tuesday, no, it's Wednesday, isn't it? I'm, I've lost which day of the week it is. We're so glad to have you all here today. Thanks for joining us this evening. We're gonna get started in just a second, give another minute. There's still a few folks joining, and getting connected. Perfect. And thank you guys for turning on your cameras. I appreciate that. I, we like to see faces. So anyone um, who is is willing, like please feel free to, to turn on your cameras. And I know we've got parents in here and students. Hey, Joshua, how are you? I see you. Here. Good. Um, and so some definitely some students that, that I know and re names that I recognize. I'm happy to see you guys this evening. My name's Melissa Yakubowski. I'm the Director of Undergraduate Admissions and I've had the pleasure of seeing just about every one of your files and, and you all are a wonderful bunch of students, I have to say. Um, we're excited to have you joining our honors program this evening. And just a couple of housekeeping um, notes. We do have a uh, recording going on because we will make this session available to other students who couldn't join us this evening who have been admitted to the program. Um, and so just be aware of that. So if you're uncomfortable being on camera, then please, it's, it is really up to you, but we do like to see your faces. Hi, Katie Maiman. How are you? Beautiful face. Um, so good to see you guys. I am uh, just here to kind of do the kickoff and, and pass it off to our director and associate director of the honors program. Um, they are going to be here to kind of share some information and perspectives with you this evening, answer any questions that you might have. They have been, um, they have received the questions that some of you have asked in advance. So know that they're going to try to work those questions in. We do have the chat, so feel free if you do have questions about the program or about um, just next steps and things that are going to be happening uh, coming up. Don't hesitate to put those in there. I'm going to be monitoring um, that and, and helping to answer some of those questions and posing them to Dr. Slint and Dr. Scanlon. Um, and in the meantime, I just ask that you kind of keep your um, keep yourselves on mute just because it, it becomes a little bit of an echo chamber when, um, when everyone is uh, is unmuted. Um, but if you have questions and you want to ask them uh, when we get to that point, don't hesitate. We're, we'd love to hear your voices as well as see your faces. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our, our director, Dr. Kelly Slunt, who's professor of chemistry um, and a Mary Wash alum herself, um, and associate director, Dr. Mara Scanlon, who's a professor of English to kind of kick us off this evening. So ladies. Thank you, Melissa. As Melissa said, I'm Kelly Slunt. I am a, an alum as well as actually a parent of a current UMW Honor Scholar who will be graduating this May. So I play lots of roles here at the university in terms of professor, a director of the Honors Program, as well as alum and parent. Um, so it's my pleasure to um, greet you all this evening and to tell you a little bit more about our program. So I'm going to share my screen. We have a brief um, PowerPoint presentation that we're going to go through. And as Melissa indicated, we did review the questions that we received ahead of time from you all. Thank you so much for submitting those. And we will try very hard to address those in our presentation or immediately after our presentation. And then we will also then, as Melissa said, follow up with any questions that arise during our presentation um, that you put in. So um, we just wanted to provide a very quick overview of our program. And um, the honors program is designed as an intellectual home for our high achieving students. Um, one, at least several of you had asked about the size of our class. Um, we strive to have about 10% of the UMW population um, participating, which usually ends up averaging about um, anywhere between 75 and 100 students um, that we have in the program per um, graduating class or per entering class. And um, we've designed the program around a motto of be more. And this is that we are striving to have our scholars 
um, excel obviously in academics. You all are academically high achieving students. And so we do want to see you continue um, those academic pursuits, but we also want to see you engaged as leaders, either on campus or in our local community as well as um, community servants um, working on the civic engagement project. Um, our program is um, designed so that anyone in any major, except for nursing, unfortunately, can participate in this program. So it is a university-wide program. We have students in pretty much every major on campus. Um, and, um, you know, this, we do hope that they are, you know, a very vibrant, creative, diverse group of individuals. Um, they, you've, um, you will soon hear from our associate director, Dr. Scanlon. Um, as um, Melissa um, said, we are both professors on campus, so we are um, faculty members, um, you know, very engaged in teaching our classes, but we are also um, you know, involved in trying to provide um, a co-curricular experience that is enriched for you all as scholars. So we do try to provide some programming and courses that we will talk about that will help you reach your full potential. And so first I wanna start with some of the program perks. I know several of you had asked questions about, um, you know, what, what can be offered through the program. Um, and Dr. Scanlon will talk later about how schedules for incoming honor scholars are developed. But following your first semester at Mary Washington, you will receive priority registration. Um, registration for classes at Mary Washington is based on the number of credits that you have earned. And so therefore students who have been at the institution longest um, typically are the ones who would register first, but honor students do receive priority registration and this enables them to register for honors designated courses as well as other courses. Um, other things that we offer, and we'll talk a little bit more about these, is we do offer um, field trips and programs for honor students. And one of the things that um, there was also a question about any fees associated with the program. We do not have a program fee um, that you would pay annually. Um, I will talk in a few moments about one fee that we have, but there is no annual fee to participate in the program. And we work very hard to utilize our budget to um, support the students and provide opportunities. So our field trips and programs are available to students free of charge as one of the perks of participating in the honors program. Also, we do not um, have any honor specific housing. And this is by design. Um, when the program was started almost 10 years ago, the student body uh, um, insisted that there not be an exclusive dormitory for the honor scholars. And over the years, we have continued to talk to students about this and it is still decided that they would not want to have an exclusive dorm for um, the honor scholars. But instead, we do have an honors commons, and this is a space that is centrally located um, on campus. It's in Lee Hall, right next to the bookstore. Um, if you're on campus sometime and would like to see this space, please just let us know and, and we can get you access. Um, Dr. Scanlon likes to call it our little rabbit hole. Um, and so, um, but I do encourage you to come see it. But in the Honors Commons, um, both Dr. Scanlon and I both have our own offices here. Um, there's also a computer room where we do have free printing. So that's another um, perk. We have a little kitchenette where we have some hot beverages and each student can design their own mug um, so that they can in enjoy some coffee or hot chocolate. And then we have um, some common areas where students can either watch TV or, or do some collaborative work. Um, in addition, we do offer academic advising. You will have at Mary Washington uh, a first year advisor. And then when you declare a major or majors, you will have an advisor within that field of study. 
but throughout your four years or three years, however long you're at Mary Washington, Dr. Scanlon and I will also serve as an additional academic advisor. So we are available to do um, programmatic uh, advising as well as kind of holistic advising, looking at how everything can trades together. We also do try to offer some professional programming um, that we'll talk about later. One of the other um, perks is if you are interested in medical school, um, we do have an articulation agreement with a GW School of Medicine for an early acceptance program. Uh, this is where students um, can apply um, to GW in their second year at Mary Washington, and if accepted, and as long as they continue to keep meeting the requirements of GW, um, they will um, enter GW School of Medicine after four years of study. One of the things that I think makes Mary Washington's honors program unique among others, and we'll try to talk about some of those things this evening, is our um, signature CityS text program. And hopefully you all soon receive an email about this. Um, if, if you, when you deposit um, to come to Mary Washington, you should receive an email about this. Um, CityS text is a trademarked pedagogy from the National Collegiate Honor Council. And if you ever uh, attend a national meeting of that organization, they have CityS text at every national conference that they hold. It's a way to get you out of the conference hall and to actually have um, faculty and participants engage with this pedagogy. It is is if you were reading a book, you are actually reading a place or a landscape. And we had originally in, uh, integrated this to our program as an early arrival program. And it was so successful, but also we didn't feel that we had enough time in the two days of early arrival to really engage with the pedagogy. So we have changed this into our first course experience that our students in the honors program engage with. Um, so you will be still involved in an early arrival. You will arrive on campus on Sunday the 14th. Um, if you are living on campus, you will move into your, into your specific dorm room. So remember, as I said, there is no honors dorm on campus, but you will move into whichever dorm room you are assigned to. We'll then have an open house for your family, and then we'll start into the programming. Um, most of the early arrival programming will involve tours of the Fredericksburg area, visiting the local museum, and also hearing from some of our city officials. Last year, we were able to have the mayor and the vice mayor, as well as a number of uh, the other offices around the city of Fredericksburg to come and greet the students, but also tell them about opportunities to engage with the city. And then um, we'll have a course on Monday evenings. We have worked with other offices on campus to make sure there's no conflicts, especially with our student athletes. And so that is why one might ask, why are you meeting on Monday evenings at seven o'clock? This is the um, most agreed, agreed upon time that would have the least amount of conflicts so that our students can participate in other cohorts on campus. And so we'll meet on Monday evenings for the first half of the semester and go through some more um, um, exercises such as ethnographic observations, learning more about historic preservation. Um, last year that ended up being a huge discussion about bridges. So if you're into bridges, just, just wait. Um, and then um, we will also hear from representatives from our multicultural center and this will ultimately lead to you all doing your own walkabout around the city of Fredericksburg. Now, if you're a native of Fredericksburg, don't worry. If you're a commuting student, we still expect that you will be participating in this program. And believe me, you will learn something new about the city. Um, Dr. Scanlon and I took a, um, a refresher course last summer on City as Text. And because of the pandemic, we couldn't travel somewhere to, to do this. We walked downtown and we both discovered new things in our, in our brief walkabout. So it, it really will expose you to the city. 
we culminate with a presentation um, of the findings of the students. And that presentation is um, attended by stakeholders. The mayor always comes. She really loves the event. Um, President Pino is there. Provost O'Donnell um, attends. So it's, it's a great event that culminates that experience. This is the one place in which we do have a fee. So there is a $100 course fee that is associated with this. It is just added to your tuition as a course fee. Um, but uh, the, when we did have the questions about fees, that is the only fee that is associated with the honors program. And that fee is just necessary because we do need to cover the costs of all of the tours and the early arrival part, your meals and, and things that are associated with the early um, other events that we have that we try to build community with are some of our field trips. And um, we have here pictured a few of our field trips. Um, these are pre-pandemic. Um, so on the left are some images of students when we were able to go to the launch of the Dear Evan Hansen novel. We had read the play as um, part of the common read that year, and they had the um, they had an event in which the individuals who wrote and um, wrote the music for the musical performed. And you can see in the bottom, some of our honor students were selected to have a individual meeting with those individuals and um, were able to get their books signed. Uh, on the right is our, I guess, our most recent field trip, which was a uh, guided hike to um, a local wildlife area. And um, the students were able to hear about the area as we hiked. Fortunately, we're finally able to reinstate field trips. And so in three weeks, we're gonna be heading down to Maymont in Richmond and get a, a tour of the historic house, as well as then have the students able to go around the grounds. And again, as I said, these are included in, in you know, and available for any student in the honors program. Turn this over now to Dr. Scanlon. And Dr. Scanlon, if when you're done, want me to advance the slide, just let me know. Okay, I will. Thank you. Um, I'm, as Dr. Slant said, I'm Dr. Scanlon. I've taught at Mary Wash for um, a long time 20, 20 years, 21 years. Um, and I'm an English professor. Dr. Slant and I are. Um, compatible in part because we're two halves of the same brain and therefore we balance ourselves our, each other very nicely. So I feel I need to tell you all that even though I look like Violet Beauregard right now, something changed with my lighting when the, when the slides went on. I'm not actually blue, but um, uh, to d let, let it not distract you. So I want to talk about some of our programs that we have in addition to um, the fun of the field trips. Our field trips are often kind of a combination of education and fun, really. But um, one of the things we got some questions about were internship opportunities and the placement of Mary Wash between Richmond and DC um, and job development opportunities. So um, I, I'm going to talk, uh, focus tonight a little bit more on some of our. Um, more community building and wellness activities, but I did want to mention that we regularly offer um, professional development and uh, informational programming for the students also. We often do this in connection with other offices on campus. So for instance, the Center for Career and Professional Development has offered several programs for us. They um, did one about seeking internships. How do you find them? How do you pitch yourself? How do you figure out, how do you identify what skills you have that match different internships? Um, they did one for us about our internal program called Handshake, which is kind of like a LinkedIn for college students. And they helped everybody set up a personal profile. Um, they've coded all of the honor students as honors in there so that if a, an employer or an internship provider is looking for you in LinkedIn, which also happens, that your honor status is one of the things that they see. Um, they helped us talk one, one, one time we had a program in which they um, did some training about informational interviewing. 
how to do it, how you ask the questions, what the purpose is, purpose of it is, how you approach somebody for such an interview. And we've done some similar programming that is, I would say, a combination of professional and personal development with a few other offices. For instance, to give just one example, a couple of years ago, our Office of Disability Resources Director did a program for interested honor students called Accessibility 101. And it was um, an overview of what inclusion and, in and accessibility looks like in school and the workplace. And I mean, society in general, but focused on those areas. So not only is that designed to help make all of us more uh, tolerant and aware individuals, but it's also something that a lot of um, places of business require of their employees to have that kind of training. And it's impressive to be able to say that you've been through that training even as an undergraduate and already have a kind of a kind of leg up on it. So those are just a few examples of the things we we try to develop around campus for our honor students on a regular basis. So they may not seem to you to match the slide very well. I just thought I would mention some of them there since we'd had questions about um, internships and other things. I, it, I hope I didn't say this clearly. I hope it's evident that DC and Richmond both provide uh, very rich internship opportunities, just depending on your major. For instance, our poli sci majors are could not be better. Um, located than to be between the national and the state capital. But we have had students work in both places in all kinds of internships with um, libraries and marketing and um, uh, nonprofit organization, just pretty much everything you could imagine. And they can usually travel there on public transport. Okay, so the other part of our programming is about our commitment to thinking about honor students as full people. And um, one of the things that we started offering a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, we did it online during the pandemic, which wasn't wasn't as nice, but we were pretty dedicated to it. But um, every Thursday at five o'clock, we have an optional half hour guided meditation. And when we are in person on campus, we hold it in the Lydecker Center, which is a center for Asian studies on campus that has a meditation space where we can sit on the floor on cushions. It's very calming, quiet. And um, and we do a, just a guided meditation together. Dr. Slant and I both attend it and um, a number of students attend it. Friends of students come. We have almost always have students who aren't honor students who um, decide they're going to come join us every week, which is all great with us. And um, it's just kind of a nice supportive way to let go of some stress as we end the week. And it's one of the various ways we've been trying to focus a little bit on, on wellness. And especially during the pandemic, when students lived on campus, we tried to come up with, a, but, but there wasn't a lot of in-person stuff. We tried to come up with a lot of programs that got people outside and away from their, their screens. We did a service event cleaning up the river trails in town. We did a scavenger hunt around town and campus that they could do in small teams. And um, so we tried to come up with things to get people moving and in community when we all felt uh, so isolated. Um, so, as part of our focus on honors as one of the as the home one of the possible home bases for you at Mary Wash, if you're in a team or there's another organization you're part of, maybe in your major, you may have a variety of places that you find you really belong and where you connect to people. Honors can be one of those those places. Can you advance the slide, Kelly? These slides just the, the next two slides just highlight a couple of events we have that um, one we will are now making annual, one has been annual for a long time. So you can see in the little corner of the in the corner of the slide, this little round logo for the honors program, um, which is now proliferating on a lot of our, uh, you know, t shirts and water bottles and all the other good swag we have in in waiting for you upon your arrival. Um, but based on a uh, on a craft experiment that Dr. Slunt did, actually, we decided to have a study break event doing this with our students and to simultaneously use it to help 
make our honors commons more colorful. We had only moved into the honors commons a few months before we were dispersed by COVID and it had a kind of um, clinical feel to it that we have been working against. So we offered, if students wanted to come, um, we brought treats and everybody got a canvas on which they could trace the logo using um, carbon paper. And then we had paints and other things and we all uh, painted and then um, those were mounted on one of the walls of our collaboration space, almost like a set of tiles. Some students made a couple of them and took one home. And the idea being that um, when they graduate, if they want to, in addition to taking their special mug and whatever else they're taking, they can take their tile off the wall. But in the meantime, if we do it once a year or so, we can continue to build it out with people's different visions. They were very fanciful. Some were kind of uh, architectural in there, you know, and realistic and others um, full of color, all different seasons represented, animals, you know, all, all kinds of imaginative things that emerged on that. We had a really good time doing it. Um, can you advance to the next to last one. This is an event that's actually been in place for quite some time. It was started by a student a number of years ago and we've retained it. And so you can see that these are recent pictures because people are gathered closely together, but still masked. So they're from uh, last November. And we had about 10 or 12 teams of two to four people a piece. Again, this is a combination of honor scholars and their roommates, friends, whoever they wanted to, to bring along. And we had a whole bunch of different gingerbread things and decorations, candies, um, and people um, <laughs> built wildly for a couple of hours. And then President Pano, our university president, and his wife were our su surprise celebrity judges. And they um, came in and heard about all the pieces and awarded um, the prizes, which were, you know, certificates. So not super exciting, but they were, um, it, it was the bragging rights of the prize that was big. This is a really, popular event near the end of the fall semester when tensions tend to run high for students um, with uh, classwork ratcheting up. And um, it's been a very, a very popular annual event for us. We were really glad to get it back in person this past year. So um, I just to segue to our last slide, which is a little bit more practical in nature. Um, one thing I it's important to me to say about academics, because talking about requirements always sounds very, um, you know, serious and and uh, even oppressive. And um, we want to make sure everybody understands what you do to complete the honors program. So, you, you know what you're getting you're getting into. But something that Dr. Slunt and I are are very committed to is um, I don't know how to say this without sounding like I'm denigrating academics, and I'm 100% not, because we, one of the things that brings people to honors is the strength of their academics. But I guess we're dedicated to the idea that by the time you've gotten this far, you've earned a lot of gold stars, and you don't really need to earn more gold stars. You don't have to prove yourself over and over again. You don't have to be the best at everything over again. We're way more interested now in your ability to, to follow your curious minds into new avenues um, in your major, in other classes, in campus events, in the community, wherever it takes you, um, but not necessarily to feel like numbers and scores and so on are the kinds of definitions they may have been for you to this point. So with that said, though, I want to talk about what the academic program looks like and to, to say that though some students, I think, feel overwhelmed when they look at it holistically like this, um, you're entirely prepped to get through this. And there's a lot of support to make sure you're on track. And it it tracks along with your general progress in um, in your major and toward your your degree. So one of the the first thing, Sidious Tax Honors 101, is something Dr. Slunt's already talked a fair amount about. It it earns one credit for you. It just meets one hour a week for half the semester, in addition to that pre-arrival. And it's a, a pass fail, satisfactory, unsatisfactory kind of um, kind of class. And uh, you will be automatically enrolled in that course once you accept an invitation to the honors program. So uh, you won't have to do anything to get put into it. Um, you just make the arrangements to get there a little bit early, but you'll be enrolled in it. 
The second thing that's there is about honors designated coursework, 12 credits total. Most classes at Mary Wash are three credits, but those that have labs or a few others might be four. So it's a credit base rather than course base. So folks ask some questions about what makes Mary Wash honors different. In addition to, I think, this uh, the holistic focus that we really strive for beyond just academic excellence, one of the things is actually in the design of the coursework. So many honors programs are what I think of as like a pull-in model where, say, in your freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, you get pulled into one honors, maybe an interdisciplinary seminar or something run by the honors director that is in addition to your other classes. Our honors program rather is something you might think of as a push out program where we've taken some of the concepts that are important to honors education and um, helped faculty develop courses across the disciplines that are honors designated, which means they've gone through an approval process with our faculty honors committee to say um, this is what distinguishes this class as an honors class. And these are searchable designations you can see when you're registering for classes. I want a class that um, is in uh, chemistry and is honors. Show me what's there, right, and, uh, on any given semester. So um, a typical difference in an honors designated class, first of all, though most of our classes at Mary Washington are small, we have a really great faculty to student ratio overall. But sometimes, especially on the lower levels, like by which I mean the classes that you'll see are numbered 100, 200, which is to say they're usually not as specialized as the ones at three to 400. The lower level classes can sometimes be a bit bigger, like a slightly more of a lecture environment than, I mean, nothing like the lectures you would land in at, you know, UVA or Tech or another very large school, but, um, but for Mary Wash, bigger. The honors classes are always capped at 20 to 25 students, and they tend to be um, much more active learning, more student focused or student directed, maybe have unusual ways of reaching the course goals. Sometimes they have uh, community service elements to them. They might replace something like a series of comprehension quizzes, you know, did you understand this, with something much more higher level thinking, like can you and another and, and some members of a small group apply these principles and give an oral presentation on it, right? So they're kind of different ways of learning and um, they are open not only to honor students, but to others who want that kind of an experience. As long as there's room in the class for them, they can, um, they can sign up to. And there are students who seek them out who aren't in the program because they like that, that style. So, in kind of higher ed lingo, we call that across the curriculum, meaning that it's something that's fulfilled not just in one type of course, but in a whole bunch of types of courses. And you'll see other things that are called across the curriculum when you come to Mary Wash and are learning about the things you need to take to earn your degree. This is how the honors designated coursework gets completed. And it often gets completed in conjunction with especially your general education requirements, which are the sort of distributed um, subject areas that you learn in, and then sometimes in your major requirements also. I'm going to say something about how we build your schedules just at the end of this, but let me just tick off the other requirements here. In your second year at Mary Wash, in either fall or spring, your choice, you do another one credit honors class called Honor Service Learning where you put in about 20 hours of community service with an organization that may be something you already have a relationship with. If you've been working in Best Buddies and you want to continue doing it, we, we try to facilitate that. And if you don't, then we have standing relationships with a lot of different places in the community, and we work out a contract about how you'll fulfill them. So a lot of our pre-med students will work at the Moss Free Clinic. We have um, 
people who work with environmental groups in town, people who work with children, with old people, with animals, with, you know, all, all the kind of uh, communities you think of. We have regularly had students who work doing tutoring in refugee services through Catholic charities. We've had students who train to do taxes for those who need help in the spring, um, for older people who need tax support, tax preparation support. So it's taken a lot of different forms. Sometimes our students have even developed really unique service with local um, places in the community. We had students a couple of years ago who put together uh, some written work for, um, for one of the organizations that we regularly work with and made some new brochures and other things for them. Uh, so it's, it's got a lot of forms to it. The capstone project is something nobody really needs to worry about um, until they're near the end of their time, but it is it's it's what in you would call an individual study in again in the kind of lingo of the of higher ed and it. It means that you work usually alone, sometimes with a partner or a team, but usually alone with one professor who is mentoring your project and you develop the topic of the project, which could be research, it could be a creative project. Some students do a kind of practical project or, um, you know, we've had students in the College of Education who do, who develop educational materials as part of their capstone work. Um, so it's, a, it's a, essentially a protected three credits that you complete as part of the honors program, but where you get to really direct and do an immersive dive into something you really care about and that um, really interests you. It's great for your resume, applying to jobs and going to graduate school, but even if you don't need it for that. It's a wonderful thing to get to do as as an undergraduate. And um, for most students, it earns those three credits directly into one their major or one of their majors or their minor. And so um, usually it will fulfill something for your major course of study also rather than being an add on uh, that you must complete. The other program requirements listed there are non-credited things that are completed across the course of your time at Mary Wash. Um, we have a system by which we ask all of our students to uh, reflect on their own leadership practices and strengths through a variety of leadership positions. We understand really clearly that leadership doesn't always look like an elected position. People lead from within and from behind in all kinds of ways and all, all manner of ways. Um, we want students to think about what leadership looks like to them through, through one of the things they're involved with or um, sometimes working with the honors program itself with admissions and, and so on. Capstone prep is just a short workshop we do required for our students before they do the capstone project to make sure they have a practical sense of what it looks like. I, I teach that class and I call it demystifying the capstone because that's its whole purpose. What, what's this actually going to look like? How do I sign up for it? How do I write the proposal for it? And so on. And the co-curricular events are something that's spread in each semester that you are enrolled as an honor student at Mary Wash. You are asked to go to one event on campus um, that's not required for a class. And then you write a kind of summary reflection of it, trying to get people out to experience new things in the community. Um, I, I send out an email every Monday to all the honor students with all kinds of announcements, reminders, et cetera. And I keep a running list there of the co-curriculars that I know about happening on campus, lectures, plays, um, a number of the events through our multicultural center. Sometimes we have things in our galleries or sometimes there are things in the community that are, um, appropriate to. There's usually a lot to choose from and students are, are able to choose something that we hope it's expands their, you know, exposes them to something new, but is something they're really, really interested in. So I just want to say one thing to wrap up this part of the presentation. And, and we had a question about what a typical first year schedule looks like. So one thing, um, though you don't have priority registration technically your first semester, um, it is true that Dr. Slint and I build the schedules personally for all of the incoming honor students. And with, within some limitations, we get first crack at a lot of stuff. So we, we try very hard to honor that in part because a lot of our students, it, let me say the greatest thing about that perk is that it relieves so much anxiety for people. When you can get the classes that you want or need, it, it is just, it, it's so 
much easier. It's so anxiety relieving. Um, a lot of our students come in with a lot of credits, and so they might be ready for more upper level classes than they would normally access in a normal registration slot, or uh, they might be majoring in a couple of majors, and that's more complicated. So that's part of why that, that uh, benefit has been developed. So we would build your, your schedule, and in a typical first semester, right, one thing you know is that you would have City as Text, one credit that lasts half a semester. Everybody coming in will take a first year seminar. And when you've deposited, you, some of you may have received this, you get a questionnaire that asks you to rank a number of things you're interested in for your first year seminar and some other of your general education distri sort of distributed classes. There are a few seminars that are actually honors designated. And so if you wanted to begin addressing your 12 credits of honors designated coursework in your very first semester, you could rank an honors designated freshman seminar at the top of your your list they have a little in asterisk and an indication at the bottom that says they can count toward toward your honors designated coursework um, otherwise what we will try to do is as much as possible use the interests you've indicated to us we'll try to get you in at least one class directly related to your major of interest if you have a major it's okay if you're undecided that's all good with us but if you have a field you're really interested in we'll try to get you started in that with a course that will apply to it if we can we will try to get you in at least one honors designated course especially if you didn't choose one for your FSM, just to help people feel secure that they're beginning to move through those requirements and give them a clear experience in an, in, with an honors pedagogy in their, their first semester. So as an example, next fall, I'm teaching an honors designated class uh, that is a lower level English class. It's a, an international literature class that I've been teaching for many years and love. Um, so if the upper level honor students don't take all those slots, um, and they might because they're speaking intensive, so I will make no promises on it, but it's if they left some, then we would put our honor students in that, right? Get that the first year students and let them get that spot. There are many other classes like that that we'll be choosing from um, to try to, to get students started with it when we can. Most students will take City as Text and five other classes. If you're in the sciences and you have a couple of lab courses, like you're going to do a chemistry and a biology class in your first semester because you're pre-med, you will not have five classes because your credit load is, is too heavy and the schedule's too tight. So you would probably have four in City as Text. If you're bringing in a lot of credits or if you're just uncertain about your first semester, you feel like you need to get your feet under you, you may decide you only want four classes and eventually you'll be able to make those changes to your schedule and, and also to change out things we put you in that you thought you know oh at some point I, I thought it seemed like a really great idea to take this but i've <laughs> i've fully changed my mind now you'll have a time time to make those changes yourself later what we do is give you a solid foundation if you choose to change nothing you can be assured that everything you're going to take that semester will count for graduation and will make progress toward completing your, uh, your honors requirements. So I'm gonna stop there with our more formal talk at you point and just say, um, we wanted to open the questions with um, one question that we had a, a, a couple of students asking something a little bit related. And that was about undergraduate research at Mary Washington. It's something we really, uh, pride ourselves on as an institution, the opportunity to do that. For honor students, the capstone is one of the places many people are assured they're going to do a kind of rich research. But somebody asked even, when do I start doing research as an undergrad? And I think Dr. Slant and I both want to just say one word about this before we open to you, um, because it's very discipline specific. Um, P.S. Discipline in college means subject. Okay, so when somebody says, what, what discipline are you doing it in? They mean like, English or history. That's a, a word a lot of people don't know when they're coming in and it throws them because it has such a, for many of us, it has a kind of negative um, connotation. So um, in my discipline, for instance, in English, there may be a situation in the humanities, say, where um, 
a professor is doing research and they decide to bring in students. I know one of our Spanish professors now has a couple of honor students who are not seniors who are working with her doing uh, research projects, but most people will do outside of their classes, that research will be more in their in their senior year, sometimes junior year, but more senior year. So you might do research papers or projects in a class, but not so much um, the extended research. It's really quite different in the sciences. So let me let Dr. Slant say something about that. Yeah, so thank you. Um, in the sciences, it really, it depends on the student as to when they want to start, but there are a lot of faculty who are welcome students to start doing research as early as second semester of their freshman year if they are interested. We have um, a course called UREZ 197. It's an undergraduate research course where you're almost like a, um, a mentor. I mean, you're being mentored by an older research student often, so you can get starting to get engaged with a research project and then continue eventually to reaching the independent study where you would be then doing our independent study courses. So that is definitely a possibility. Um, we had also had a question about, has anybody done a capstone related to veterinary medicine? And I just thought I would take a, a few moments to elaborate on what Dr. Scanlon had said and also just to, to talk a little bit about, again, the capstone. The capstone is really an individualized experience for the students. And you can either join possibly a research project uh, in the sciences that's already been established by a faculty member and get experience there, or you can come up with your own. Um, and um, so definitely um, you could um, personalize it to do something related to veterinary medicine. Um, we had recently a student who was a classics major and a biology major, and she studied the domestication of animals in ancient Rome. That was what she wanted to do. That was related to, I mean, she's interested in going to vet school, but she also really wanted to utilize her classics background um, to, uh, in her capstone. Um, so just wanted to let you know that. That was a cool project. And when our students do major in many different things, sometimes they bring them together in fascinating ways. We have a student finishing her capstone right now who is a chemistry and English major. She's like me and Dr. Slant in one person. And she is doing a project on applying um, a certain scientific theory to 19th century novels. Um, it's really fascinating. So do you guys, we've been, I think Melissa has been busy answering questions in the, uh, in the comments. Um, and one I'll just say out loud in case folks haven't been watching it. I see that, that Joshua asked, what if you're not sure about your major? Will you be exposed to a lot of stuff? And the answer is yes. And it's the honors program will expose you, but also your regular curriculum will expose you. At a liberal arts school like Mary Wash, you have the chance to be exposed to a lot of different, a lot of different disciplines. Um, and it's not a situation where you lose those credits if you change majors. Sometimes when you're in, say, a college of business and you change your mind, you lose those credits because they're very separate. Uh, and that's not the case at, at Mary Washington. Um, they, you find your way forward with the help of your advisors and the classes you take. One of the ways when I teach first year seminar, I like to tell my students to think about those general education requirements in different disciplines that might be helpful for you as you think about them. We're used to thinking about requirements, as I said before, as like boxes we tick off and um, things somebody is forcing us to do. I'd really encourage you to think about them not only as a time of exploration, but to think the reason you're being asked to do it is this. You may not be, sometimes students will say, well, I'm never gonna be a psychologist. Why should I take psychology? It is really useful as a human being in the world to think about um, what kinds of questions do different people ask about the world? And where do they try to find answers to those questions? by what methods, or are they even questions that they think there are answers to? Right. So you could look at one phenomenon. Um, an example I used last semester with my students was, what if you have a lake that has a high level of um, pharmaceutical residues in it? We all know that's an issue in climate science. Well, 
if you were a WGST, women's and women's gender and sexuality studies major, and there was a high level of estrogen in that lake, you would be asking different questions about it than would somebody in environmental science, than would somebody in geography, um, then would then you would if you were a creative writer who wanted to write a lyric essay about what it meant in this particular environment. There's all kinds of ways that people might look at the same phenomenon and try to figure out um, what they want to ask about it and how how to get to it. Right now in my upper level honors literature class, I have a computer science major named Jane who said to me the other day, I said, Jane, you're doing really well in here, even though you're really far out of your comfort zone. And she said, um, I spend so long figuring out how to do things. It's really interesting for me to be in a class where I'm asking, should we do things? We we're reading literature about uh, World War I. And so the kind of ethical questions and so on we were, were raising, you know, she was really loving stretching her mind in, in a different way. And she nailed really well what the differences were. So yes, Joshua, you'll figure it out with the help of advisors and other people. But for all of you, as you think about what your first year at college looks like, um, be excited about that, I think. It, it makes you, you'll find your niche you want to major in, but it also makes you a smarter person in the world to be exposed to a lot of those, um, those different disciplines and ways of approaching our common experiences and problems. That's a great segue into, we've seen several questions about academic advising and how does that work on campus? So when, as, as I think we've alluded to, um, when you sign up for classes, you will be, um, you will, the first course that will be announced to you will be your first year seminar course. And um, that first year seminar course is also tied to your housing. So I know we've had some questions about housing. So when you deposit, you will select your first year seminar course. And as I said, there is kind of a tie into to housing. And um, that first year seminar course will be taught by an instructor who will serve as your first academic advisor. And they will help you navigate your first semester at Mary Washington, selecting your classes for your second semester, as well as kind of helping you navigate your second semester at Mary Washington. Um, as I had also mentioned, Dr. Scanlon and I will also be academic advisors who are available to you. We can meet with you to offer you academic advice, helping you with selecting classes, et cetera. Um, every time, every semester before you register for classes, you are required at Mary Washington to meet with an academic advisor. So you are never going through this journey alone. There will always be a faculty member to guide you. And like we said, the honor students have multiple faculty guiding them, which is, which is a nice uh, blessing. Then um, once you declare a major, you will lose your freshman seminar advisor unless they become your major advisor. Um, but you will retain Dr. Scanlon and I. And then that major advisor will be somebody in that discipline. So you would not be, and sometimes we've seen that we have students who have very broad interests and they decide, for example, to take Dr. Scanlon's down the rabbit hole, FSEM, um, you know, and she's an English professor, but they're actually a chemistry major. And, you know, we've seen that it, it's sometimes very useful for that individual to be advised by a chemistry major. So I can say to them, oh, by the way, in order to get into this very hard to get into class, like our biochemistry lab, it has permission of the instructor on it. Make sure that you go talk to such and such a faculty member so that it's easier that you get advice from a person specific in that um, discipline. So um, hopefully that addresses kind of how the academic advising is. We also have on campus um, paid academic advisors. So they work through the Office of Academic Services and you are also always welcome to make appointments with them. Um, you know, and certain students on campus, if you're ever in academic jeopardy, you know, you would maybe be required to meet with them for some more um, academic support. We also have through the Center of Career and Professional Development, we have um, professional advisors. 
And so you could meet with um, Dr. Kinsley, who is part of the College of Business. She is one of the faculty fellows over there, and she could provide you with professional advice on how to get internships. Um, Dr. Odell is our pre-health advisor. So anyone who's interested in medical school, vet school, um, you know, osteopathic uh, schools can meet with Dr. Rodell for those types of professional advising. So we have, you know, academic advisors as well as professional advisors that are um, available to you on campus. Um, Let's see, there was also one other question about the honors program. And if it is not a fit for you, can you withdraw from the program? Um, yes. Um, so we hope that you won't. We hope that you will find this an engaging and wonderful program and want to stay. But we also often recognize that high achieving students often want to do other things. They want to double major, triple major, and you know it, it doesn't fit in. And so um, you can withdraw at any point in time from the program. What you will lose, of course, is you will lose access to us as academic advisors. You'll lose access to the priority registration, access to honors comments, things like that. Um, but um, you can do that. We do caution students really have a meeting with us before you make that decision. Because we've seen in the past sometimes like students are like, I'm going to withdraw from the honors program. They're in their senior year. They want to withdraw because they didn't think that they could do the capstone project, but didn't they didn't realize that they're already doing the capstone project in their major. And, you know, so just really do ask that, that you um, do that, uh, you know, with them. Um, somebody just asked, is it is it possible to be in the honors program and double major? And a question, um, do students get complete freedom in choosing the topic of their research? The answer to both of those is, is yes. So we actually have many honor students who are double majors and a minor. Um, and sometimes other things also, you know, they're doing all, all sorts of stuff, especially if you have some AP or dual enrollment credits when you arrive. Um, those can fulfill requirements for you. I, I talked to them about my talk to my advisors about them more as credits in the bank that give you a lot more freedom because um, you can you can then you know disperse your credits a little bit more as you wish. But it is not uh, difficult in any way to double major and minor and finish the honors program, especially because as I noted about the honors designated classes, they tend to correspond to your general education or sometimes major requirements. So they'll they'll double up for you. In terms of choosing the topic of your research, the answer is, uh, as far as honors is concerned, pretty much yes. The question is, um, the only question is, will the sponsoring department um, say yes we have somebody who can oversee that research or is can stretch to oversee that research and we think it earns credit in that major now sometimes we have students who want to do a project that really isn't appropriate as an academic credit within a certain major and so they do it under um, the course number honr 491 which is the individual studies number that means honors and so sometimes it's interdisciplinary um, we had a student a couple of years ago who was very interested in disability studies, and she was a psych major, but she'd taken a lot of classes in English, and she noticed that, uh, and both of those disciplines talk a lot about disability in different ways. She noticed that they talked about them differently and used really different ways of thinking about disability, where in my discipline, it's often talked about as a kind of identity factor. In psychology, as you might imagine, it's often talked about as a pathology to be treated. And she wanted to do a capstone project about, um, about this disparity and to think about ways that the way literary studies and more humanities talk about disability, which was her preferred way of thinking about it as a student with the, uh, dis several disabilities herself, how that could be brought more into the realm of psychology. She decided she'd be most comfortable doing that as an HONR class. Sometimes we have students do very practical projects. Uh, Dr. Slunt has been working with a student who has severe food allergies and um, wanted to do a project about best practices in institutions of higher ed in, in the management 
uh, on campus of food allergies according to the laws that govern the treatment of allergies and um, nutritionists. And I mean, she's been working on this project, um, earning credits and doing good research, but different than the kind of research people might be doing in other ways. So um, I, I don't think I've ever had a student say to me, at least, I couldn't make this work. Sometimes they shift the project a bit for the professor that they're working with who thinks it should be directed in another way. But in honors, we're pretty, um, you know, we'd like to see you get to do whatever you want that's a worthwhile project and try to work with you to, to get there. Um, there's a, just a question, is there gender neutral housing? Is it difficult to get into? Yes, there is. There's a dorm right in the center of campus, actually um, very close to where the bookstore admissions and the honors commons are in Lee called Madison Hall that is gender neutral housing. It's open to students across all four years. So whereas uh, most students will be placed in their housing based on the FSM they're in and you'll at some point you get kind of information if you're in these FSMs, you're in Virginia and these FSMs are housed as a way of helping students get to know someone in one of their classes and form a bit of a community. There's a couple of exceptions to it. And one of them is students who want to opt into gender neutral housing. We also have a women's only um, floor for students who don't want to live in a co-ed dormitory. Um, are there any others, Melissa? Am I forgetting any? I think that's it. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have several Actually, we've had, se had several honor students this year in new students who had opted right away to live in gender neutral housing rather than moving in later as um, more advanced students. I don't think it's difficult to get into, but everything, with that said, everything is safer if you're ready to deposit and fill out your questionnaires and so on as soon as possible, you know, you can feel more secure about it. Um, I would be really surprised if someone who really desired gender neutral housing was turned away from it. Um, I think they would be trying, trying to work that out. Melissa, can you address the question about scholarships because I don't have any idea. Yep. No, I was actually typing it out, but I'm going to just say uh, thanks for the question, Erin. Um, Essentially, your merit scholarship comes with your offer of admission, so that should be included and that that's a renewable scholarship for four years, provided you um, maintain your on or off campus status, depending on how you're admitted and, and you are successful in meeting um, academic requirements going on, but we don't set you up for failure and you're all really strong students, so you, um, you shouldn't have any problems maintaining that that academically as well. Um, if you filed the FAFSA, your um, FAFSA should be processed and, and that typically is about a two week turnaround time. So um, if you feel like you it's been longer than that, then then send me a quick message offline and I'll take a look into that um, uh, tomorrow with with staff and make sure that there is not a hold up matching social security numbers or something else that is kind of complicating things. But your offer letter should have included um, your merit scholarship, which is based on your academics at the point of admission. It was a question about it being renewed, Melissa. It is renewable, correct, over the correct. four years? It is. So it's four years of undergraduate um, enrollment. So um, so definitely, as long as you are, are, most of you are probably living on campus. There may be some of you who are commuters. We have differing amounts based on essentially your cost of attendance. As an out-of-stater, you're gonna pay more. So the scholarship is a little bit bigger. As a residential student, you're gonna pay more. So that scholarship is a little bit bigger. As a commuter student, it's a little bit less because you don't have the same kind of cost. But um, provided you maintain that status and, and you are successful academically, you should have no problem renewing that all four years. And there are other things that you may qualify for down the road. So. Um, you know, this is just really your first year kind of situation. Once you are um, into a major or involved in student life and activities, there could be other things that you're a great fit for um, that you would apply to receive through the scholarship application in the Office of Financial Aid. Yeah, no um, Sorry. Um, the Daniela had asked a question, are there other scholarships? Sorry, Kelly, go ahead. Yeah, so there is one scholarship that I'm aware of that is 
specifically had been started for the honors program. And as Melissa said, there is the scholarship portal and I would encourage all of you to go in there um, and you know, once you're a deposited student because there are other opportunities that can come there, but there is nothing that like, just because of being part of the honors program, there isn't, isn't a specific scholarship, but there are opportunities that you can apply for. Um, the other thing with conducting um, undergraduate research, um, as Dr. Scanlon had talked about, undergraduate research is highly valued here in Mary Washington, and we do have a fund that supports undergraduate research and students can apply for um, that with undergraduate grants. And you know, not only does that provide you funding for your research, but it also does um, provide you with some valuable skills for starting to write grants. And for some people in certain professions, that will be extremely important. Um, and um, we also have some summer opportunities. We have the Summer Science Research Program um, where students can stay on campus and work with um, faculty in the sciences. And they most recently just started a similar program in the humanities. Um, so, um, you know, there are opportunities um, for that as well. Those are programs that have uh, a stipend for them and housing um to they're re they're really great the undergraduate research funds we see a, honor students who need that funding for their projects apply quite a bit for their capstones everything from you know lab specimens or software or travel to an archive um certain materials a couple of years ago we had a student in historic preservation do a project on what what happens to olympic buildings when the olympics are gone and she used her undergraduate research fund to travel to la and study the buildings that were there from the la olympics it was really it was really interesting um and so you you know she submitted a budget for what she needed and she she was funded to do it Melissa, can you answer that question? Because I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> I like the question. I have to read it. And, and, and Aaron, I'm sorry I responded to the entire group about it. Like, I'm just putting all your business out there, but I can see your scholarship in there. So we'll talk offline. I'll follow up. Um, so, you know, when we, we understand that students are waiting to hear and consider options, and you guys because of the kind of um, high achieving students that you are, you've got lots of great options, we know that. Um, and so, you know, the it, it's not necessarily gonna limit the scholarships that you can apply for or to. I, I will say, um, we really do try to put our best merit scholarship and financial aid need-based scholarship out there at the front end of things. Um, there are some awards and certainly if there are issues with, you know, if there's a, a, a gap that you just need you're, you're like, I can't quite make it happen. Can we talk about this? Can, you know, we are as admissions counselors are, um, are happy to try to talk about alternatives and options to kind of help you meet that gap um, at different points. The, the online scholar application, I would say um, is, is a little bit more limited for first year students. So just be aware of that. Like, because we do try to put things out um, uh, a little bit earlier and in, in the best package forward, what you're going to find in the scholar application for first year students is a bit more limited. There really is much more out there that's available to continuing students. Um, so absolutely, you can do it. It doesn't hurt, um, but you're not going to, you know, Daniela, I think you're going to be just fine if you feel like you need to wait. The other thing that you can do, our deposits are refundable until May 1. So just be aware of that. So if you want to you know, hedge your bets and, and, you know, make sure that you're kind of in line if Mary Washington, I, I certainly, I know the service academies are a pretty sweet deal. I, I looked at that myself as a, a prospective student. Um, you know, there, there, you could still kind of say, if I know that Mary Washington is the, my next best fit after, after that, you could line yourself up to be in a good place, uh, you know, uh, as best as you can and still actually get a refund on your deposit um, but before May 1 if, um, if you get a, a, an aff affirmative response from the service academy. So, um, so definitely don't hesitate to reach out to your admissions counselor if you have these kinds of questions. We are not, um, we are happy to kind of advise you and, and talk with you about that if you don't know and haven't met your admission counselor yet. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat and you guys can drop me a line at any point and I will connect you with them um, and and we'll go from there. So don't hesitate. There's no question that's that's silly or 
um, you know, or, or stupid, like this is all new for every single one of you. You've not done this before. Even if you've got a sibling that's gone on ahead of you, they're, you're all different. And so um, don't hesitate to kind of ask the questions that you're, you have concerns about. We're happy to answer them. I would um, just add that the honors program has a pretty detailed website on the Mary Washington page. If you go to the home page and click on academics, you can get it right there. Or you can just search honors program and you can get a lot of information there, but also there's a contact us button. And unlike some of those buttons, it doesn't, it doesn't go to a black hole. It actually comes directly to me and Dr. Slant and we will answer it quickly. So, it, so a few of you on the call have actually used that already to reach out with questions. But if you, if you have more, um, please don't hesitate to, to ask us. And I also put our email in our general email in the chat. And, and like Dr. Scanlon said, it does not go to a black box. It, it goes to us and we respond typically within 24 to 48 hours. Okay, I just posted the FSM link in the chat too, if anybody wants to go take a look at those. Um, so far, we, we have had a couple of them fill. There are about 40 to 45 of them out there. So there's a variety to choose from in every discipline, remember, department, discipline, department, um, mm -hmm. major, all of those good things. Um, so definitely um, explore those. When you get into the actual questionnaire as an enrolling student, that is where you will see which FSEMs are assigned to which first year building. Um, I can share with you that we are going to be having first years live in Willard Hall in Virginia Hall, which two, two of their most recently renovated spaces on campus right in the heart of life um, and outdoor spaces in our indoor living room in the University Center. Um, Randolph, I believe, is also going to be first year again this year. It's either Randolph or Mason. I'm pretty sure it's Randolph. And Westmoreland, which people affectionately refer to as Westmo. Whoa, yeah. that's a change. Well, so some students are going to be so sad. I have students devoted to Westmo. I, I know. It's, it's, um, it's a little, it's an older building, but has a lot of charm. And so, um, and I love um, they, there's a um, a space in the basement in the basement that's kind of their lounge area that we also love to call this the um, skate park because it's got some sloping walls looks kind of like a you know a skater park anyway um, so definitely check those out there really isn't a bad space to live on campus um, and uh, and so again if you have questions about your next steps um, you can check the you are in page umw.edu slash you are in i'll put that out there um, and um, and certainly reach out to your admission counselor we are happy to help you through all of that um, and and more so um, let us know this off here okay you thanks guys. for coming you guys Yes, thank you so much. We lo I love seeing familiar names. Thank you guys. Okay. Erin, no touch base, okay? I'm going to email you after this. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Good night.